Looks at pacing, takes two bounces, runs to 30. This will be a wonderful goal. Coast to coast footy from the D's. She's had a couple of bounces. Here we go. She's got Woodland over the top. Oh. And as Woodland gets her fourth. <laughs> Try to free up Morford there, but comes out to the Dockers. And Bowers sends it inside 50 with a torpedo. Which way will it bounce? It might go all the way. The Gold Coast Suns. Bahana has just sealed what has been an unbelievable final quarter of football. Well, it was a massive weekend of football. Round two certainly didn't disappoint. We've got plenty to unpack here on the W Show. Thanks to Nav and to help me do all of that, Collingwood star Bree Davey and award-winning journalist Sarah Black. Bree, welcome to you. It's good to see you. Our, our hearts all broke for you last week. How are you going? Yeah, no, thanks, Nat. I'm doing all right. It's um, been a tough first week, but the support from everybody has been incredible, um, you know, from the wider public and teammates alike. So it's, um, yeah, kept me going. All right, we will talk to you a little bit more about that in a little moment. Sarah, great to have footy, round two, and it was excellent footy. Yeah, round two, we're really starting to get into it now, and I think we saw some of the top teams really start to separate themselves from the rest of the competition. Certainly, because we have four teams who are 2-0 and o at the moment and on Sunday night it was the Fremantle Dockers who made a massive statement with an emphatic 32-point win over the Giants. And Sarah, Frio now have kept their opponents goalless in six out of eight quarters, which is quite astounding, great defensively. And then you look at their forward line, we thought maybe some doubts with Ash Sharp and Sabrina Duffy not being there this year, but they've covered well. Yeah, they really have. And it's been two girls who have been on their list for quite some time now. We've finally got their chance at the top level. Anya Tai, the um, Irish woman, you know, she's had knee injuries and she's back. She's been a really key, uh, key target up there for them. And we all love the story also of Anne McMahon, of course, had those really horrific workplace injuries. Um, but she's added some real grunt up in that forward line. And while they're not like-for-like -like replacements for uh, Sharp and Duffy, I think they've done a really good job. I mean, Bree, when you look at Frio, I know it's early days and they've played the Giants and West Coast so far, but you look at 2020, they were undefeated that season. Last year they started red hot 4-0 and and then dropped off, ended up missing finals. They probably faltered against the, the top sides over the last couple of years. What do they need to do to take that next step, I guess, to be considered the real deal? Yeah, look, I think it's it's one of those things when you're playing against different teams, um, it's about a lot of the game is actually mental and particularly when you're getting closer to finals, all the teams you're playing are good and um, the teams at the top are very good um, and you've got to sort of step up to the plate and I think it's that mental side of the game you've got to work on. Obviously, I'm not in the four walls of Freya and they could be doing a lot of work in that area, but I think that's um, it's definitely part of the game that um, is underestimated by a lot of people. Well, there were celebrations aplenty on Sunday with the Gold Coast Suns breaking a very long drought. 672 days, if you can believe it, since their last win. Cameron Joyce's first as a coach. It was a wild final term, Sarah, because eight goals were kicked after just four in the first three quarters of the game. It was crazy. Yeah, I was covering this game. I think it's safe to say I had about five different versions of the match report as it was going along. <laughs> um, first three quarters, nothing to write home about. Um, but, you know, if you haven't caught the last quarter, make sure you do because the Eagles skipped away to a three-goal lead. Maddie Collier had a really nice set shot to uh, put them three goals ahead. And then the Suns just clicked into a gear we haven't seen before from them. The midfield, we've got Charlie Robottom and Ellie Hampson in there, um, really broke the game open. But then, of course, the efforts of Tara Bahana here, um, kicking three goals in just her second game of AFLW in one quarter. I mean, I think a lot of people were surprised that she was overlooked in the NAB AFLW draft last year. You've seen her play for the Southern Saints in the VFLW. What, what were your thoughts? Yeah, look, I've, I've watched her a couple of years at Southern Saints and um, for me, when, when I watched her play, I remember saying to my partner who was there playing there at the time, you know, why isn't she getting picked up? She's a, she's a sure kick. She has a beautiful left foot kick as well. Um, and just really composed and, and sure on the ball, clean hands. So I was really surprised she got overlooked in um, the draft before this one. Um, but it was really pleasantly, I was happy for her that she got picked up this time around and um, she's doing well so far. Certainly is. It was disappointing though for West Coast who were so close to getting their first win of the season. This was their new coach, Michael Pryor, after the game. Yeah, my head's telling me now there'll be changes, but uh, I'll calm down and, and, and have a closer look at it in the next couple of days. But, uh, yeah, we've got a healthy list. Um, we've got our girls uh, that will train this afternoon that didn't play. 
um, and they'll be pushing for a spot because, we, as I said, we've got too many that are down at the moment and there's pressure on for spots and we didn't make too many changes last week. We made one that was forced through injury, um, so we need to look at that. Sarah, what needs to change and who's in the gun? Yeah, pretty strong words from Michael Pryor there. In just his second um, game in charge, I was pretty impressed with how forthright he was. Obviously, he said he'll, he'll take a moment to calm down after the yep. immediate impact Breathe. of the game and take a <laughs> breath. Yeah, but it was really... Dana Hooker and um, Emma Swanson were fabulous as always, but it was some of their younger players who really struggled, which is fair enough. Like, they, they do have quite a few young midfielders in there. Charlie Thomas and Bella Lewis were, you know, fairly quiet. Um, unfortunately for the Eagles, looking at their list and who isn't playing at the moment, it doesn't... There's not a huge huge amount of senior depth to come back into the side. Amara Cameron will. Um, she'll add some firepower up forward. Hayley Bullis is probably the only senior midfielder who's not in the team at the moment. But then you're sort of looking at Courtney Rowley, Sinead Davison, you know, quite young players. Um, and unfortunately for the Eagles, they've got Adelaide next week. So it doesn't get any easier. No, it certainly doesn't. What does it do to the playing group when the coach comes out and, and says, you know, there's going to be changes, competition for spots, you know, too many passengers? What does that do amongst the playing group? Yeah, look, it's, it's, it is a tough one. And, you know, with groups, they can go either one or two ways. I think it can sometimes either damage players' confidence, um, which obviously is the negative side of it. But mm. um, the positive is that it really might you know, put a fire in a lot of bellies and, and make the team really step up and push harder. So we'll see how it goes for them. Um, I think Sarah hit the nail on the head, like with a young group and also, you know, a newer team that have had to expand and, and try and find players. Um, it's going to be, you know, probably a bit of a tough season for them. Saturday night, what a night it was because we had the Press Parkers family enjoy a really beautiful moment with Maddie and Georgie going head to head. Mum and Dad drove three hours from Echuca to see the two play against each other and Sarah bragging rights. We're with Maddie at the moment. Bragging rights with Maddie, with the older sister, as they should be. <laughs> I think, Bree, you've got a That's few it. sisters. You know what the pecking <laughs> yeah. order's like. Um, no, it was a really, it was really good to see those two go head to head, and they did go head to head at times. Um, of course, Georgie here ended up with a, a fairly bloodied nose um, after this collision while attempting to tackle Maddie. Um, ironically enough, although I think Rachel Kearns did most of the damage with yep. that hip coming through. Definitely a friendly fire there. It's never easy playing against a family member or someone you know. I mean, according to Tilly you faked an injury just so you wouldn't have to play against the Saints oh, on the weekend. Yeah. But is it awkward? Because, I mean, you know so many of the players now. Is it yeah. sometimes weird lining up on someone that you, you actually know quite well socially? Yeah, oh, it's such a good question. Like, look, for me, I've, I've never ha had to play against my sister, so I can't imagine how they were feeling. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, we are all cr pretty good mates out there and I think once you pass that white line, it's almost like you forget about that. So, But, yeah, haven't experienced playing against a sister, so they've done well. Yeah, they have indeed. This was Matt speaking after the match. I've tried not to get emotional but I think to play with your sister is something that I'll be forever grateful for. Not playing with her, sorry, playing against her. We've never done it before and sort of to live our dream playing AFLW and being able to run out against her and almost break her nose um, was the best experience ever and um, I'm sure it's a day we'll never forget and same with our parents and stuff over there. Now, Georgie, of course, was the round one NAB AFLW Rising Star nominee last week, along, of course, with Kangaroo Mia King. And we caught up with the pair during the week just to find out a little bit more about them. Don't know if it's much of a karaoke song, but I do love Olivia Rodrigo, so maybe Trader by Olivia Rodrigo. Uh, probably Cover Me in Sunshine by Pink. Pantry, definitely. Fridge definitely cools that down. Ooh, camping under the stars. Under the stars. Oh, there's a few I could throw under the bus there, but I won't. Except me, probably Emma Carney. Can I say a couple? If so, uh, Annabelle Johnson, Georgie Rankin, Amy McDonald, Nina Morrison. I love Duff. Just happened. Joel, Joel Salwood takes that one. Ooh, uh, probably Taryn, Tazzy Boy. Probably last weekend against the Kangas for the debut game. Maybe with a win instead. Um, probably the game against Fremantle last year here at Arden Street. Um, we won the game, it was very close, and then we got through to the final. Money Heist. Upper Middle Bogan. Ooh, some of the clothes Mum dressed me in are pretty questionable. I would go back and change if I could. Skinny jeans, for sure. Ew. A favourite thing. 
Just being in her company, she's pretty funny at times. Um, least favourite thing about Maddie, she's her dog actually, Bam Bam. He is so annoying sometimes, so there's nothing worse than having him around sometimes. I love it. Karaoke song, what's the go-to? I've got a couple I love, but my number one would have to be Valerie by Amy Winehouse. Oh, love yes, it. love banger. that. That's a good one. <laughs> Pretty much anything Taylor Swift, I reckon. Um, all too well. It would be a good yep. one to yep. just belt out. It's great. Toto yep. Africa is... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's showing my age. It's actually really hard to sing and I don't know. So <laughs> let's be fair. All right, we spoke about the Dockers off the top, but Melbourne is also looking really, really impressive at the moment. During the pre-season of the captain's survey, it was the Ds that were voted most likely to make the grand final, which is really impressive. What, I guess, makes them so dangerous, Bree? Yeah, look, like you said with the captain's vote, no surprise there for me as well. I think Melbourne will be up there. Um, I look, for me, I think it's more just the way they move the footy. They're yeah, so right. clean, their skills. Um, they go by foot a lot, but they also go really direct through the corridor and they're not afraid to pull the trigger. I think, um, you know, some teams going inside can get be, be a bit scary, but they sort of just take it on and um, I think that'll be their weapon this year and teams are going to have to really try and um, shut that down. They have a really dynamic attack as well. They've already had a spread of eight goal kickers across the two rounds and Alyssa Bannon, she just brought the house down on Friday night with this cracking goal on the run. As we watch the vision here, she just takes it on, arches the back, a couple of bounces and then slots it through. But I want to show, and she does this little diamond celebration, which <laughs> we want to find out a little bit more about because it kind of caught on. There you go. As the night wanted, this is the behind the goals vision. So that is Daisy Pierce right there, who looks to be free for about five minute. So when the skipper's on like that, you want to make sure you kick that free. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah, look, I mean, the goal itself was great. And I think people underestimate how hard it is to actually run and carry. By the time you kick the ball, your legs are gone. So <laughs> she's done well to finish. But yeah, look, if I see my skipper in, in the goal square, I'm giving it to him every day of the week. <laughs> and if you, well, you are a co-captain. Yeah, so yeah. if you're in the goal square and you've got, you know, Sarah Rowe or Steph, your fellow co-captain, Steph Kiochi, screaming towards you on the wing, are yeah. you calling for that ball? Oh, absolutely. And they're getting a spray if they're not giving it. <laughs> but no, definitely. I think for me as well, it's like what what's the safest? And for me, it would be popping it over to your captain to finish it off. But great goal. And like I said, um, you know, really well done on finishing it after probably having very tired legs. And I love the confidence of a young player just going, nah, I'm going to own this and I'm going to take responsibility for, for kicking this one. And I hope she does plenty more of it throughout the season. Another side that, of course, is a contender are the Adelaide Crows and they got the job done over the ruse on Sunday. Ash Woodlands is an absolute star. Another four goals, which basically makes her, I think, the only player in AFLW history to have kicked eight goals across the first two rounds. Bree, Take me through this because the inside 50 count was actually even for both sides, 30 to 29 in the favour of the Crows, but it was the way in which they went forward and moved that ball forward that was so impressive. Yeah, look, with Adelaide, they're just, they've are just they got such good representation across the field and I think one of the things they do really well is they hold their structures no matter what is sort of going on in the game. Um, and they've got good contested winners, so they win the ball at the contest and then they get it forward as quickly as they can. Um, and like you see here, the ball goes into the forward 50 and they have numbers and that's what's so important. It was incredible, Sarah. One in every three mark, uh, sorry, one in every three entries ended up being a mark. So aerially strong too. Yeah, very, very much so. And probably signals also a breakdown at North Melbourne um, with that midfield defensive transition, that the fact that they're getting so many balls away so cleanly and finding targets. Interestingly enough, North moved Talia Randall to the forward line this year and she didn't. they didn't swing her back at all yep. during that game. So that is an option that they have going forward, um, you know, if the game is getting away from them and Ash Woodland getting on a roll. Well, we can't have a conversation about contenders and not talk about your pie. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it was incredible on the weekend. I know it was against the Saints, but considering you were missing Steph Hiochi, is missing, Chloe Malloy was missing as well. It just proved that you have so much depth. It was Britt Benici who stood up and then Jamie Lambert, who's our star power this week. Just so clean and, and has great vision. 
Oh, absolutely not. And I think that's what sort of sets her apart is is how clean she is with her disposals. Um, you know, obviously, within the mids especially, it, it is a disposals game, getting your hands on the footy. But um, I think what sets mids apart is what they can actually do with those disposals. And I think she opens up the game quite well, Sarah. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it's, it's really important um, that she takes that leadership, especially without you. I know you don't want to talk about the fact that you're not out there. <laughs> but, um, you know, you do have quite a few young midfielders around too. Michaela Can, um, you know, and like Ebo Day. Um, um, and for Jamie to really take that step forward, I think is going to be really important for Collingwood going forward for this season. Yeah, definitely. What's the plan for you now? And how did you go watching on the weekend? Yeah, so the plan now is just getting into surgery as soon as I can. So seeing the surgeon, hopefully a couple of weeks, be in, um, you know, get the surgery done. Um, it, it is tough watching. I, I don't necessarily love being on the other side of um, the sidelines, but it's been really good to be able to, I guess, um, I guess stretch my leadership in a different way and, and get me to sort of grow as a leader and a person in a different way as well. So tough to watch but was so happy and stoked the girls got the job done and I knew they would. Um, such depth in the squad and just a really great team. And one thing in Victoria that we need to be aware of is the fact that elective surgery has actually been postponed for a little while just as a result of COVID. What does that mean for you and if it's pushed too late does that then affect the following season? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm not too stressed about it at the moment. Um, we're hoping it'll be only a couple more weeks. But, um, yeah, look, the more it's extended, uh, you hope it doesn't start to then affect the length of your rehab and push it f further, especially if we do have a season that's potentially brought forward. Don't know yet. But, um, yeah, hoping to get in ASAP. Not stressed at the moment. Maybe in two or three weeks, if I'm still not in, ask me then. I might be a bit more stressed. <laughs> So we just saw some vision of you doing, you know, a cardio workout, an upper yep. body cardio workout. So much fun. I mean, you've been there before with an ACL rehab. What is the most challenging part of it all? Look, it's definitely in the mental side of it. And we, you touched on before how I'm doing at the moment and, and being so good because I've had so much support. But, you know, as, the, as the, you go on through your rehab, you do sort of slowly, I guess, feel like you're more sort of on your own. And, and that's just the way it is in rehab. It can be, feel quite lonely. Um, so I think that's going to be the hardest, but it's just that mental side of it and, and feeling motivated um, all the time is hard. So um, and with rehab, it's really important you try and get get every little step done to make sure you can come back in peak form and play your best footy. So um, definitely the mental side and, and those tedious little steps you have to take throughout the rehab. I guess to help with that loneliness, do you reach out to Izzy and, and Kate Lutkins, who also did their ACLs in the same round? Yeah, oh, we've already started a little group chat, so oh, that's, it's, nice. that's been nice. And oh, they're both such great humans, and um, we'll definitely lean on each other in the process. Um, and you know, there's a couple of girls pre in the preseason who obviously went down as well, young Tiana Smith and um, things like that. So we'll try and get a little group of us together and support each other through. Time now, though, for a really serious question. For you. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is going on at Collingwood? I need everyone to look at this. What oh, is this? This no. is Sarah Rowe. What is she doing? She is so funny. Uh, Sarah, for those who don't know, if you don't follow her on Instagram already, she's extroverted, you know, hates attention, obviously. Um, but no, look, that was a fines night. Um, basically, you accumulate the most fines, you have to spin a wheel, you get right. a punishment. So her punishment was that she had to perform a song to the whole team, a dance, a bit of a sing. Um, and she didn't want to do it. She was trying to put it off for weeks, but we finally made her do it. But instead of just doing the song, as you saw, she's dressed up for it too. So she's gone all out. So she wore an adult nappy by choice, is what you're saying. <laughs> and a dummy, yes, basically. <laughs> and what song lends itself to an adult nappy? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. You're probably thinking all sorts of things, but it was a nursery rhyme that was remixed, so Gosh. it was a Wheels on the Bus. Um, yeah. So wow. It was I have so many questions, but I think they're all for Sarah, <laughs> not for you. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Well, before we go, of course, round three is Pride Round, a chance for us to celebrate inclusiveness in football. And last year's um, inaugural Pride Round was such a, a huge success and it was fabulous. And this year will be no different. The aura is definitely in the air when you go to a Pride game. For people to come and to wear those vibrant colours and express who they are, or even if they're expressing for somebody else that they know and they love, that there in itself is huge for the progression that we've made in our country. It's created that inclusivity that we're looking for and, and inviting people to come to our games and feel comfortable and confident that they can be who they are. It also creates that uncomfortable discussion which I think we need to have and and why we feel the way we feel but to communicate those things is, is really important to better understand so we can move forward and celebrate together. 
In this day and age, we're all so diverse and so different. Our, our bloodlines are not only mixed, but who we are and who we're discovering to be is also something new to us all. So gone are the days of just, you marry the same person and, and you stay with them for the rest of your life. You still might be finding your soulmate and, and that might be a woman and a woman or a man and a man. So I think it's important that we do keep creating those conversations away from when we're just at the game, when we're at home or when we're in a social environment. Yes, it's great to have a celebration around, but to continue those conversations later and, and prior, I think that's where that real growth and understanding comes. I feel like the AFLW community has been at the forefront of sport in this country when it comes to inclusiveness, um, embracing um, gender diversity, sexual diversity. What is it like? Can you talk us through what it's like being part of this community where it's just as though everyone is embraced no matter what walk of life? And I really feel like it's player driven. Yeah, oh look, it's amazing to be a part of. It's such an inclusive, beautiful community to be a part of really. Um, I think as well, you know, the foundations of women's footy in particular has been built on acceptance and, and love and, and, you know, basically just bringing everyone in and accepting them for who they are. Yeah. So um, it's, it's beautiful to be a part of and um, something that I um, agree, I think players alike definitely help drive that uh, message and the community that come along to the games are all there for the same reasons and there to support each other as well. And one thing that the general public always get really excited about are the Pride Guernseys and you've designed Collingwood's jersey. Um, can you show us and can you yes. talk us through it? Yeah, sure. So yeah, I was part of um, the, the Guernsey that we designed at Collingwood, which I was so stoked to be a part of, being part of the LGBTQI plus community myself. Um, but yeah, so basically just to quickly go through, we've got this sort of the traditional rainbow colours on this side of um, the jumper and then on this side is the transgender flag colours. So um, basically then you flip around and then on the back we have um, a bit of the progress flag too, which um, oh, basically awesome. includes yeah the brown strip you see here. <laughs> Um, which is for people of colour and representing those people within the community. And then, um, like I said, the transgender flag colours who um, often feel like a marginalised group within the community. So I thought it was really important to make sure they felt represented in the jumper and, um, yeah, just really proud to be part of making it. Amazing. Well done. That looks fabulous. Well, thanks, and can't wait to, to see the pies and all the teams run out across round three for Pride Round. Of course, Cotton On have also come to the party. They've got these amazing clubs. Love them. Uh, pride <laughs> tees. So make sure you head out and grab one and show your colours um, before you head to game. They are absolutely fabulous. So make sure you get one and show your support. Bree, thank you so much for being on the W Show. It's great to have you in and uh, best of luck over the next couple of weeks before we see you again. Thank you so much, Nat, and thank you, Sarah. No Sarah, as always, love your work and for all of Sarah's fabulous work, you can head to womens.afl and, of course, the AFLW app. Thank you so much for joining us on the W Show. Thanks to NAB. We'll see you again next week.